so hi everyone um, welcome to today's discussion on inclusivity in design today is uh, international design day and uh, this is the day we celebrate to recognize the value of design and in uh, its capacity to affect change personally i feel as designers we are facilitators to bring in the change uh, for the well-being of people and on this day uh, which is international design day if we reflect deeply on the topic like inclusivity in design it would definitely honor the diversity of the people we craft solutions for so let me start with myself i'm i'll be the host for today uh, my name is anjali and a bit of background about myself i uh, come with the education in science and my experience is in design over 18 years for the past 3 years i am with lollipop as a design lead at mumbai location uh, so what what i feel about inclusivity in design is uh, we experience the world through our uh, own set of lenses and uh, we just go with the assumption that other people in the world are experiencing in the same way uh, as we do especially when we don't think about diversity so inclusivity may not necessarily mean only considering disability but it is about considering all the dimensions of the users like their ethnicity race age gender sexuality socio economical status etc personally for me what um, i have observed is we've been in this uh, a global pandemic situation over the year and um over the past one year uh, wearing a mask has become a daily routine of uh, our whenever we step out so there are so many people when we talk they are um, not just uh, they could be uh, impaired in terms of hearing but there are a lot of people who depend on looking at your facial expressions uh, looking at lip movement to understand what you mean and because of we've been wearing mask and we've been talking through the mask there is this bunch of crowd which which is kind of neglected who don't understand what the other person is talking and uh, consider uh, a situation where someone like this going to a doctor and trying to understand the expression of the doctor what he's trying to say so uh, that example i i really feel that you know we could have thought about uh, you know inclusively Um, what we could have also done is maybe design the masks that are transparent but you know there there were a lot of efforts that were invested in designing masks that were very much decorative so uh, this this brings us us to the many questions that what is inclusive design why can't all the design be inclusive always and do we really need to look at exclusive design to understand the inclusive design now uh, and that is why this today's topic and that is why we have our great panelist and um, without further uh, delaying let me introduce uh, to all of you uh, all today's uh, panelist so let me start with darshan gandhi darshan comes with the uh, more than a decade of experience in the field of product design she is a alumnus of nid ahmedabad and harvard business school and she is a believer in inclusive design principles She is currently heading a team of designers at Gotrej Limited who are creators of many household products. We also have Alok Nandi. Alok Nandi is a designer, design strategist, storyteller, writer director, creative director. With so many feathers in his cap, he's currently the design and creative director at Architempo and Spread Design. Alok brings uh, along with his decades of experience in this field and he is a ardent believer in inclusivity in design. And last but not the least we have our own Anil. Anil is a founder and design director at Lollipop. He has been in the design industry since the dial up years and Anil's journey from New Zealand's Ogilvy uh, to shift design to being entrepreneur is very much known to all of us today. so uh, without delaying it further let me ask uh, our panelists today to share their views on today's topic and then we will uh, go to some of the burning questions that we have um, you know collected from people which uh, which are related to today's topic so 
Uh, Darshan, why don't you start? Uh, why don't we start with yourself? Sure. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for hearing our views out. And personally, very passionate about this topic. It's very close to my heart for several reasons. Um, and I, I think not just me, but all of us have experienced some sort of an exclusion or isolation at various stages of our lives, you know, um, and a couple of them that I would like to share that, you know, for example, when I, I was growing up in a small time, I grew up too tall as for the stereotypes. Uh, and, you know, uh, it wasn't some part of my life wasn't necessarily pleasant because of what we are and who we are and how people look at things differently. Um, then I went on to my architecture college and some of us were um, some of, some of us were, um, you know, expected to give our first jury in, you know, English and, you know, use the best vocabulary. And some of us had to do extra hard work in making sure that the models we make or the drawings and the renders we create are more self-explanatory self so that we don't have to speak. And maybe the professor will, will see the drawings and, you know, they'll, they'll just, you know, ask us fewer questions. Um, later when I, I went to... Uh, a design school and we had this uh, um, amazing visiting faculty from MIT, Lorna Ross, who's worked in this area for a long time in design for well-being. Uh, and this was almost the um, no, end of my, my design study and I had done several projects before that, uh, you know, um, practicing, um, uh, working on many hypothetical real products. And, and uh, her session made me really wonder about, you know, um, uh, I really want to take up this project. Uh, uh, my final project is an inclusive design project, and I chose to work on a project which was uh, working with people with lower limb disabilities because I had to narrow it down to my focus group. And I was um, I was touched. I was stunned. Uh, I had created a visual prompt because I didn't want to question, create questions, or make questions, or create an ambiance which was filled with pity or filled with uh, negativity, but I was wanting to really get into insight. So I think the, we didn't know, you know, this was not taught to me, how do I research when I'm looking for differential aspects about people, you know, how, what are the matrices, what are the measures, what are some of the things I can do differently to get to the right real insights of people, because everything we designed, we designed thinking of an ideal perfect human being, right? Which is not the case. There are very few who are like that. Actually, the majority of us are differently able. And I think that was a time um, where, when I realized that, that the design process itself is flawed. Uh, and I think that the responsibility we carry as designers and we call ourselves uh, change agent, I think it re requires a lot different uh, sensibilities, especially for our country where the the area uh, of the inquiry is very low. Um, and now even more so, it's a good time to talk about this because technology is substituting, substituting the same flawed human ideas, you know, clouded with stereotypes. Uh, and that is widely spreading to more and more audiences. So I think I'm very happy to share my insights and view on this from my personal experiences that uh, kind of touch my heart and seeing all that we design, be it architecture, interior spaces, household products, or um, uh, uh, digital products, they, they have a huge and a scope and a long way to go to be a lot more inclusive and a lot more human. Thank you, Darshan. That was really insightful and uh, a lot to hear from you more. Can we uh, go to Alok? Alok, can you please share your thoughts? Thanks, uh, Anjali, and uh, thanks, Darshan, to get into this topic, which is, uh, which is, in fact, a complex topic. When we talk about inclusive, we think about exclusive. When we talk about able, we think about disabled. And I was thinking maybe we need to step back and try to understand where are these traditions coming from. And Darshan, you mentioned some of the works you have been doing. And we know that some of the inclusive design thinking is coming from the built environment, architecture related. And suddenly, a few years ago, inclusive design came stronger in the digital landscape. 
So thinking about inclusive in software environment compared to build environment require us to use different lenses. Also, Darshan, you have been working with Godrej and there you're working with goods, products. Now a product, a physical product and a digital product are requiring us to think about inclusive in different modalities. When we talk about inclusive, and Anjali, you mentioned, we need to think about diversity. And I'll add a third word, which is equity. How are we coping with diversity, equity, and inclusivity when we are designing stuff? How are we looking into the continuum from intangible to tangible, taking into assumption one fundamental thought, which is everyone has the right to be different. And we have that tension between everyone is different and systems are trying to put those everyone in big clusters, massive clusters. Capitalism and industrialization, industrial design has put a mega cluster there. So how are we going to talk about the different person versus the massive monosystem? That's a complex question. I was busy trying to say, okay, software may allow us to be more tailored and ensure us to reflect on how to minimize this tension. So inclusive, exclusive context are some of the terms I would be curious to unbound here and look into how do we open the eyes of designers and make sure that while they are working on the specs, on the specifications, how are we going to include inclusive design notions de facto? The paradox is, as designers, we need to have that embedded. But constraints and systems are pushing us to have this conversation today because we see in many places that it is not in place. And so it's good to have the conversation with all of you and thanks to the team having organized that because it allows us to reflect. And by reflecting, it allows us to make sure that all the people who are attending this session and all the others are putting that high on the agenda. I want to add two or three other notions. One which is inclusive design, like corporate social responsibility, like climate change, like uh, sustainability. Uh, they are there sometimes to do some brainwashing for business voila. And we as designers, we need to be hands-on and action-oriented. And my questioning to all of us is how to make sure that it doesn't remain a kind of generic principle and that we try to make that as hands-on as possible because design is about doing. And design is about doing, but it's also about influencing those who are controlling systems. Because I don't want to go into that cliche where designers are responsible for everything. I don't think so. There are policymakers who are responsible for some things. There is the citizen who's res responsible for some other things. How do we react and reflect as a good neighbor is one of the questions that I'm having on the table for all of us, knowing especially what is happening nowadays in India and everywhere on the planet. And my notion of good neighbor is trying to go back from this meta concept to this everyday notion that all of us need to work on. How do I respect the other? How do I make sure that the systems we are designing are paying dignity to the other? And so these questions of respect, dignity, uh, good neighbor are things that I would like to put now here on the table and see how we'll have the discussion going through. Thanks, uh, Anjali. 
Thank you, Alok, for bringing in so many various aspects that are attached to this topic and which are very much relevant. So, Anil, moving on to you, can you please share your thoughts on the with the group? Thanks, Anjali. Uh, happy International Day to everyone. And uh, this is a wonderful topic. And um, Darshan and Alok have shared wonderful insights. So for me, inclusion is innovation. And um, I think there is plenty room for us to innovate. Uh, now that the technology is ready. So when I started my career, we did speak about uh, inclusive design. But back then, right, the development effort was so much, no business was ready to even include um, physically disabled uh, people into the experience. So it, it was a task to um, convince business to get into such practice. But today, that's not the case. Today, it's become a huge business opportunity. There's a trillion dollar market and uh, business have started realizing it. So inclusive design is not just a moral necessity, but it's a pure um, business opportunity out there. And today, whichever business or brand would, don't take this seriously, right? They're losing on a big opportunity. And for us as a designers, right, we have started including this in our process. Just a few years back, we, were, um, we had technical challenges and we were limited with the knowledge, but three, four years back, we designed a project called Enable Academy that kind of gave us insights about what are the shortcuts and how can we include everyone into the picture and create a wonderful experience. I think today we're going to talk about one, the business opportunity and second one, how to include everyone in our design process. Thank you, Anjali. Thank you, Anil. That was really great from coming from three of you. So uh, if you can move to the questions, uh, the first question which I would like to ask uh, three of you is, are there really any kind of design principles to keep in mind if we are thinking of uh, designing inclusively? You want to go, Alok? Let me jump in, Anil. Okay, so all of you are going to go answer this question. Okay, so uh, I'll try to build on what we began to explore, which is software versus hardware. And I would say that in software, we have some principles which are more flexible than hardware. When I mean hardware is, I mean built environment and connected. First, telling that inclusive means putting everyone into the same basket doesn't make sense. We need to add the notion of appropriate design for some specific populations. And that leads us into complex questioning. So let me try to take care of first the software one. The software one is first, and, and Anil, you you touch upon by telling a kind of fantastic experience. How do we provide fantastic experience for everyone is a basic question that we shall try to explore. And there we'll see some of the principles. One being, for example, consistency. If we provide something, taking into account different types of people, how do we make sure that we are consistent in what we are delivering? How are we putting priority so that they, at the end of the experience, ex enjoy the same overall stuff? Which means, how do we offer choice? Offering choice in a software environment is something possible and more complex in a physical environment. But we need to Think about alternatives. So consistency, think about alternatives, give power to the person, to the people, give control on how they navigate in systems. Physical system require different ways of navigation, which are embedded. Software system 
gives us more freedom into designing the stuff, but require us to think more profoundly in shaping the software environment so that the experience remains smooth and so forth. So comparable experience is what we are talking about. Comparable doesn't mean the same experience for everyone, but the appropriate experience taking into account that everyone has got different needs and aspirations. So we are considering the context and taking into account those contexts, we are applying those principles. Now those principles are changing according to what I would call the vehicle. When you are navigating in a mobile phone compared to a desktop, compared to whatever software places, you are making sure that it's smooth, it's flowing. The challenge comes when we are getting into mixed reality environment, combining hardware and software, combining technology which is physical, mechanical with technology which is software oriented. The other challenge is we as human beings, we understand that the others are different, hopefully. But software and algorithms and machine learnings and AI, they are based on some of the understanding we have of the others. And that's where all these principles I'm talking about we need to carefully revisit them, taking into account that algorithms don't think that all human beings are different. And this is not philosophy. This is design question. And so I'll leave you with all this to try to say, okay, how do we connect the dots? Because I have put quite a number of bricks on the table and I see Darshan is smiling because now she says, okay, let's play with that. Hope it triggers enough interesting conversation. So Anjali, in our past project, we had uh, people involved to give us feedback because we don't feel them. And we really don't know what they're going through when they use technology. I'm talking from a digital uh, perspective. So we got them involved and uh, we had invited them to our office and um, we gave them certain activities and we kind of um, recorded how they're using it and we built everything around them. And that was an eye opener for us. And uh, the process, right, I think for designers today, I'm gonna to talk from a business angle. While we are all emotional about this topic, I'm gonna to keep my emotions aside. I'm gonna speak from a business angle because for us designers, right, we have to sell this concept to the client. The, the brand out there, our clients are not aware of it. They're not ready to invest. They're not ready to give us an extra time. So today I'm gonna to touch more on the business side and uh, in the process, I know it's time consuming and it is it adds up to the cost, but it's always good to get everyone involved, especially when we are not aware of such users, such behaviors, right? It's always good to get them involved. That's uh, very uh, correctly said, Adel. And uh, thanks, Alok, for sharing your thoughts. The one point which I really uh, liked is building the appropriate experience for everyone. And we have to consider about consistency. We have to consider about alternatives and giving power to navigate. That's the entire spectrum we need to look at as a users when we are designing something. And the principles should be based on that. So, uh, Anil, you've been focusing more on uh, from the business point of view. And our next uh, question, um, if, if, if it's okay to, for me to go to the next question, the next question is, uh, does making design inclusive come with an extra cost for the businesses? Uh, would you like to take that, Anil? Yeah, I'll take this up. So it does come with an extra cost, but not as bad as what it used to look a couple of years back. Um, technology has improved and we can get, uh, we can include a lot of things in the normal process. So it's not like you have to rebuild everything to target such users. And let's understand, um, my, the, the sad part is uh, the wheelchair, right? It doesn't look as cool as the office chair. And the office chairs or workstation chairs has evolved. So designers have continuously been 
designing cool looking office chairs but if you look at a wheelchair right you real people don't really feel like giving it a shot and this is one of the um, things that we observed when we were designing for uh, enable academy so we all wanted to sit but it, there was no cool factor in it so there was nothing that we wanted to sit and try things out so if you have to look at from a business angle right i think we designers we have to really prepare ourselves with numbers to convince the client so that they can give us that extra time and the cost so the data clearly says that the 15 15% of the world population will go through some sort of a um, disability in their life some sort of a disability now if you take a 15% right let's break it down in indian context 1.36 billion is what our population is if you want to if you have to break it down to 15% it's 400 million we are basically excluding 400 million so 400 million is a huge opportunity so this is my way of selling it to the client telling that please include 400 million people into this and this percentage is going to grow like if you look at deaf people percentage right i think it's close to 30% and this is going to grow to close to 900 million in 2025 i mean this was this was the data says so 900 million if you don't include right that will that will become a joke in future so um now what we should do as a designers or as an organization right we should make it look super cool like our office chairs so we should bring in innovation into it we should make it more fun we should make it more um kind of um excitement into this such kind of uh, inclusivity topic so while this talk, while this uh, session is a great start um i'm sure that a lot of designers have 1000 ideas now as a design as a community we all have to come together when we come together right we will have great ideas when we have great ideas right we will propose those things to the client when clients look at it they will definitely come forward and invest to answer your question for today does it take extra cost and time yes but not as bad as what it used to be few years back and today we are already started including all these things in our process thank you anil and uh, darshan would you like to share your thoughts on it because you you have a great experience in terms of uh, 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 working on the uh, products and uh, what what's your view and on this so when it comes to uh, i'm going to keep it broadly to overall inclusive solution so I think inclusive design is not a separate discipline. It's not like a specialized field of design, right? It is. It's an integrated practice in whatever you do, whatever products and services you are designing. How can you increase the uh, accessibility or inclusivity, uh, and how can you be more universal in that? And to answer to your question does uh, ma- making in design inclusive come with extra cost um, no i think 9 out of 10 times no at least in my experience in my area of field in whatever little i understand even about the digital world i think um, it boils down at the moment to be uh, slightly more conscious and little bit more sensitive about what you what design decisions you make right i think it doesn't come at a cost so for example adapting already available universal guidelines for public place and design for theater does it cost anything no it really doesn't cost and i think we all as designer we love constraints and guide i wouldn't call it constraint but we love some sort of guidelines right so if you have a certain guidelines building up from there on to make it look even more sexier and cooler like what anil is saying should not be that difficult so i i think it is um when what what uh, 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 earlier we discussed and what alok was saying right as as one thumb rule principle for designer is to be able to um expand your consumer set in your head it's not like given by your marketing team or business you know this one perfect human being but there are variations of these humans there could be at any any age it could be a child it could be an elderly woman it could be a pregnant lady it could be um you know any gender who would using this so things like this which are very basic are actually very easy to start with at any at no cost in your day to day practice i think that's a very good start 
to also then later show that what more and at that time if you need any extra investment or if some new idea comes up as some new market uh, you know you see that okay this is a great idea it actually can open up a new market for me and it may require some investment some more energy but say you know thinking things through things like you know choosing a matte finish floor versus a shiny italian marble what is more expensive you know for the malls for it to be safer adding basic functional forms versus stylized form and more styling that actually makes people you know the navigation even more difficult for even normal human i mean what is normal in any case but i'm saying for for the sake of you know uh, conversation i'm using this term which is not correct but for an able human beings also it's not uh, you know putting prints or writing uh, using more visuals or illustrations or icons on your pack versus writing teeny tiny uh, copy on the pack which nobody can read you know these things are very easy for us to manage whether it's digital or physical right so i think that's a good start and i think the other some of these principles i would also use like what alok was saying and what i really believe and like about what he just said that where do we draw this line what can be more inclusive and hence what is exclusive so the moment you start putting these principles out in your day to day services and products you can actually see services that require more exclusive attention more clearly and you can do a better job of it otherwise we have a tendency to add more features we have a tendency to add more styling we have a tendency to add more things to beef up your product i think that actually works counterproductive just generally for humans you know uh, because there is so much clutter already so uh, my answer to that is that no it requires it is not extra cost but it's extra imagination extra inquiry extra effort uh, uh to willingness to change and um, you know a extra focus um, on this diverse set of people right so it is as simple as that to me sure darshan that was really insightful alok uh, would you have anything to add to this i i would just uh, add one component which is reacting to anil's point of view looking at the relation between design and business i would argue that we need another player in that it's not one with the other it's the design the business but also the governance one of the painful inside that i see from digital landscape is there is a lack of what we have in the physical world which we call urban design urban design is not architecture but if we don't have urban design then architecture leads us into a complete mess because each building blocks is going into any direction so we need a kind of master planning and that's why some cities are more interesting than some others now let's translate that and bring that into digital landscape and we see that some companies uh digital companies are behaving not respecting the human beings not giving flow to the dignity dimension i was talking and that is where i think that designer versus business dialogue is not enough we need some other dimensions how do we build common spaces and that's a complex question and that's why we have that i think that conversation about uh, uh inclusive diversity equity because we have seen in the last 30 years that some of the companies are behaving in non ethical ways otherwise why would we have this conversation and next to that i would like to add another point and that's why we are all here designer is there to represent the voice of the user while marketing is there to push the product and fit the market so when we talk about representing the user i'll be critical and i say it's not enough design needs to look at all the stakeholders and look at the life cycle of systems 
And there we'll begin to have more interesting thinking and design thinking about what we need to envision. The reason why I'm coming with all these notions is that in India, let's be careful not to copy and paste what Silicon Valley is doing. I have been already saying that in some conferences and I'll be pushing that again and again. Anil, you mentioned 1.3 billion people. Why aren't we in a position to design some stuff which are so powerful and respectful for people that it can become a role model for the planet? I haven't seen many. And I'm in a position here to provoke ourselves. If we are in a design leadership position, where are all these design organizations in India setting up some principles which are allowing us to go beyond the usual surveillance capitalism cliche software that we are seeing flooding the planet. Remember that Mark Anderson, the guy who founded Netscape said that the planet is eaten by software. Now, if software is eating the planet, what are we doing as designer to make sure that software is not eating the people and the planet? If we have pandemic today, it's because we are suffering of 70 years of decisions which were not only design-led, but which were capital-led. And I would like to bring all these questions here on the table because I'm looking at inclusive at many scales. We don't need to have a simplistic view on inclusiveness. We don't need to have a software view only on inclusiveness. It's not because Microsoft has now a unit called inclusive design that we need to begin to think about inclusiveness. Mm -hmm. And we need to be more provocative and say, okay, what are we doing in India to make sure that inclusiveness, diversity, and so forth are the de facto rules and how are we making sure that we are inspiring some other parts of the planet? That would be my questioning to all of us. Now, Anjali, I'm going a little bit out of the topic in terms of uh, the question about the extra cost for business, I don't care if there is extra cost for business. I think that business should put that cost in their basic rules. And so Anil, why am I bringing all this governance and regulation aspect? Because it has implication on how businesses are commissioning design. If business know that government is asking that inclusive principles need to be respected, then it will be in the call for tenders, and then designers will put that in, and there won't be extra cost because it's part of the system. That requires a design maturity, a business maturity, an inclusive-led maturity. And that is where we need to push the agenda, we as designers, make sure that there is higher maturity than coming back with uh, notions which are, uh, I would say, 20th century. So the, uh, the ground reality is uh, any new project that we start, right, um, there is not much of an effort and a cost involved in it. Uh, like one of the recent projects that I was talking to, uh, the client had already created close to a few thousand videos. And uh, for a new redesign, I was proposing to include everyone, even the deaf people, right? If you look at, uh, there's close to 360 million people who are deaf and this is only going to grow. Now converting the video to text is a cost. It is a huge cost and the business is not ready to invest. While we, as a designer, we push it from the numbers. We present it to the client saying that this is, this is where the market is. This is what the experience is going to be if you can convert the video into text, put some subtitles and all that. But again, it's up to the business to take a call. We are ready with it. The technology is ready. And there are so many um, easy way to do things. But end of the day, there is a cost to it. Nothing comes free. And it's up to the business to take a call. And we as a designers, we are all ready for it. We are, we are ready to put that extra effort. Um, the reason why I mentioned there is a cost to it is because there are certain projects, if you're starting new, there's not much in it, but there's certain challenges, certain projects, certain legacy system, which is already running for years. If you have to convert that and include, include everyone, right? As, then there is a challenge. 
But um, just just to build on what you are saying, Anil and Alok, I think there are two levels, right? Sustainability. If you see great sustainability movement, what's happening now after so many years? It came. This changes came so many years later in our industries, and it was basically when government, uh, you know, pushed it through the policies and law and made that as a mandate. Everybody started to. Um, you know, pull up their sleeves and fast track everything and started to invest. But before that, I mean, there are so many concepts and designs that we would have presented, you know, uh, uh, which were originally um, sustainable. But because the market landscape business was not interested in taking that extra effort, never got prioritized. But say people, good investors, a lot of startups, right? I think that a lot of startup companies versus a big business are a lot more braver. They might not have cost, but they would actually support you to experiment. Um, but this is where I'm putting it back onto designer. I think it's always the case that we have to uh, push the boundaries and for that we have to be more prepared and have to put extra effort and work hard in creating this narrative, whether it is you know, that it can be a great marketing material, how do you put together a narrative that's used stat statistics, etc. cetera. But um, it's, it's just taking this chance more often. And I think keep doing that is what we can do from our end and keep showing possibilities, right? Um, but the, the, the gap uh, that I was interested in, in um, uh, talking about today also and towards the end of uh, what Alok was saying that for India, right? I mean, inclusive design is not necessarily a new field. It's been established many, many in 1990s. Some there you will find literature and paper about that, you know, uh, uh, which is there. Um, the the definition, the way UK defines their inclusivity goal versus Japan versus the Nordic regions. I don't think we have design councils or forums. Uh, or a diverse group of people who are interested or leaders who has sensitized us to put together what are the top three things through which we can create impact. Is it really disability or is it the socio-economic, socio-cultural differences first need to overcome? Because every market framework is about rural, urban, premium, mass. You know, you know how we look at business, SEC, A, B, C, D, E, I haven't seen such a long list of SECs anywhere else, right? In any other countries. And we have B1, B2, C1, C2, what not, right? Now, we ourselves culturally are so um, uh, trained for some reason to see things in classes because of our roots. I think we need to start presenting things using principles and using tools in a very different manner. Uh, using psychographics, using, you know, what do we mean? I think, I think there is there are a lot of issues at the foundational levels even before we start pitching for ideas, right? So I think I would, I would uh, be very interested if there is any such forum <laughs> that is working on this to be part of it and to actually highlight that okay, socio-economical, gender equality, uh, economical gaps are my priorities, and probably. The last last one to me uh, would be education in India because if we are educated about this topic much earlier in my earlier ages, I will not have to work so hard <laughs> uh, to convince people and leaders, right? So I think there, there there is a there is this part which needs to be addressed. I have a solution for this, and I think Alok is going to agree to this. Alok, we need design minister in India. <laughs> yeah, that I've been saying for a long time. Yeah, minister for technology, <laughs> water, <laughs> education, and all that. I think we need a minister for design. It's funny that I, one of the papers I wrote for CII I actually mentioned that you know you need a design minister. Definitely. I don't know when that's gonna happen, but it, it's interesting. So. You are bringing back the sorry, Darshan. It, you're bringing back the the governance aspect and the policy making aspect. Now, uh, I'm based here in Brussels, and uh, the European Commission has launched a program called New European Bauhaus. Now, it's going on. It's a participatory process where they are asking many stakeholders to rethink about the future by using some design methods. And Darshan, I think that this is something which needs to be 
launching in, in India with the Indian sensitivities. And if the others don't do it, you know, the design position is, let's do it. And maybe this conversation is a trigger to open a forum where we see what could happen. The interesting things which might happen is that because uh, Darshan, you have your journey, Anil, you have yours, but all the people here in this Zoom have got their journeys. How do we structure the voices to continue pushing these questions, articulating that, and making that clear to the non-design wali, non-design wala? Because what yeah. I see often is the tension between Lots of us in this room, 50 plus, are design wali, design wala, and we understand. But kia who are design, non-design wala, non-design wali, they continue their life. And we have that mega gap. How are we addressing that in order to, as Darshan, you were mentioning, to make our life less hard because we don't have to evangelize so much? I agree. Anil, when you are talking about the extra effort, it's about evangelization. And it has a cost. Even if we like doing that, it has a cost. So, Anjali, we're back to your question about, is there a cost? I would argue yes, despite Anil saying maybe not. And I would argue yes, but how are we valuing that? Because it's a question of value. Absolutely. Financial cost, emotional cost, intellectual cost. Cost is not only financial, cost is emotional, cost is uh, uh, intellectual. So how are we educating, and Darshan, I'm back 100% with you, we need to work at the education level in order to put all these questions on the table. And, and in India, education is so much cherished that we need to have design education in schools at every level because it's an attitude, a mindset, an action set, and whatever. I think absolutely, Alok, as you said, and Darshan, great points from you, as well as Anil on this, which uh, kind of answers the next, next question that I had for you, that how do we convince organization to see the value in inclusive design? Some of it is uh, how we understood is it has to come top down. If we need to have the design minister, we need to uh, bring in and continue uh, bringing in a more awareness of on this topic through forums, through such initiatives, because um, at the end, we are the facilitators. We can bring in the change. We have, as Alok, uh, at the beginning, you said we have the power to bring in the change. So, uh, any any other uh, thoughts on how do we convince the organization? Uh, do you have any more thoughts, or then we could move to the next question? Well, the, the only bit that I had, like what Alok said, that it, the ROI or business uh, interest should not be just you know financial, right? Your ROI here. Once you have your solution more inclusive, which has more complements and which addresses more expansive users, you are definitely broad based in your consumer base, right? You are you have a great scale of uh, economics in terms of you'll be able to optimize so many more resources and offerings because you don't have to exclusively have those many variants anymore. You can actually compact a lot of things and then focus on larger, bigger areas rather than you know wasting your time into smaller nitty gritties right uh, you attract great talent you you can you have free pr social media attention goodwill you'll have happy investors and eventually national growth right in the in terms of that there's so much that you can progress as a nation as as a uh, 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 you know, as humanity uh, for you to change. So there are enough social um, and both uh, financial ROIs, but it's a, it's a holistic uh, um, advantage and addition uh, into your organization. And, and if you put this all together in a form which sounds uh, uh, convincing, I don't see a reason why somebody would not invest into it. Also, I think we should show some live examples of how uh, people have solved this problem and how 
there has been an impact on the business. Um, a very good example is uh, I'm using uh, a workstation where I can adjust the height. So it's, I can dismantle it. So even people on wheelchair can use it. People who want to stand and work can use it. And you can dismantle it and keep use it on the bed. So there's multi-purpose. And the sales of this chair has increased drastically. So some real examples, if you show, right, the business will be more convinced and they'll give us an opportunity to innovate in that space. Definitely, Adit. Um, do you have anything to add, Darshan? No, I was just saying that, uh, you know, anything that I'm designing today, any of you designers think that you suppose you're designing a bag, for example, right? And I have a certain target audience, I'm focusing on that. I've already narrowed my view, right? But the moment I, as a designer, start thinking that this bag has to be used, it should be trial friendly, it should be old edge friendly also in addition to whatever I've been asked to do. It should also be uh, used by people who are uh, having some kind of physical or cognitive disorder. Yeah. The moment you will start questioning or thinking about these scenarios or users, even when you are designing for uh, mass market, the choices you will make in terms of material, details, um, you know, your um, uh, scale, everything is going to change. And I don't, I haven't seen uh, when I designed a bag at that time for, for, when, for, this, for this project, once you make it easier for uh, these diverse abilities or different abilities, it is going to be even more easier for me, right? So it's a reverse psychology. So anything yeah. I design that is easier for a child, is gonna be automatically easy for an old age person, right? So, I mean, it's is is the way to be, you know, like um, uh, what Anil said initially that it's all about innovation. It's all about how do you innovate? How do you, um, you know, play with the mechanisms and tools that you know, but you use them from a very different perspective, and the outcome will be so different and unique that you should actually be able to charge premium for that and you'll actually i'm 100 percent sure that you can create a new market and range of solutions that you can actually sell for premium that can be shared and used by all definitely darshan so uh, that that's been really insightful on you know how do we convince organization how do we convince businesses in terms of uh, uh, the ways of telling them to have i mean there is a value in inclusive design now, um, I will just take a last question, kind of a summary to sum it up everything and to see where India stands or where future goals of uh, for inclusive design in India. I would like to understand your thoughts. It could be kind of a summary for from what we have already spoken and uh, then move on to the questions uh, from the participants here. I think to summarize, it's a great opportunity for designers to innovate and uh, differentiate the brand and um, and also we need to understand there is um, temporary disability and there is permanent disability two years back i injured my arm and i couldn't use it for a month so i was just using one arm and there's a lot of things around me i couldn't use it, apart from my mobile phone so if you Look at the population, right? There's so many people going through some temporary disability or even when you look at it from this angle, uh, newborn baby, mother carrying the kid and using everything around in one arm, right? So you need to include them also. When you include, the numbers grow. When the numbers grow, it's easy to sell it to the client, to convince the client. You, for client, they always think the extreme case, right? The extremes. And they think that it's smaller percentage and we should always narrate such stories. And my story was a real story. Every few months I'm injuring something, either leg or arm or something, and too much into sports and stuff. So I'm all, always into this temporary <laughs> disability. So um, the sad part is uh, when I was going through that, I couldn't use 90% of the things that was around me that I used to use every day. So now I think it's time that we take this up seriously and uh, we as designers have to come together and make it so easy for the future designers to implement this 
and and also innovate within the technology and uh, see how we can cut the cost or there is no cost at all in it. Like a simple example is uh, text to voice. You don't need any investment in there. It's simple. It's already inbuilt inside the system. And things like that, right? Now, another uh, one big investment that the organization has to make is to convert the video into text, which is again a simple technology. Now we have solutions for that, but it's not accurate. But at least there is some solution to it. But the problem is it's not freely available. Over the period of time, it will be available freely. And um, then what is left after that is very small things. I think we can include that in the process. We can make sure all the future products that we are building. We include everyone in that, and uh, even the business. I was talking about numbers, right? It, it all runs in millions of dollars, and uh, it's 200 million people and 900 million people in 2025. Uh, um, that's the number given by a portal. I don't know which, which number of deaf people in uh, 2025. It's big numbers, and uh, we just have to be prepared for it. And uh, we are doing our bit. And technology is also running in parallel, and technology is also getting better. And uh, for me, this is a wonderful topic. And we at Lollipop, uh, we are getting ready for it. And we have been working on it, but certain things we still need technology to catch up. Once it does, I think uh, this will be a part of it. Like how we use grids, how we use um, some basic rules for designing the logo, right? Without client asking us. Those are. It, it, it will become like that. Great, Anand. Thank you so much. Darshan? Yeah, I mean, that's uh, that's whatever you just said sounds really promising. And, you know, I wish that this becomes a new set of standard. Uh, you know, we redefine the standards. We refer to ergonomics for many things, but ergonomics are designed for perfect pictures. You know, they are not flexible enough. So how do we challenge some of those standards considering inclusive principles. And I mean, until, I mean, there, there are, um, uh, I have lots of insights already from my research and I would, I'm, I'm very tempted with Alok's, um, uh, you know, proposal of, can we start a council and can we use, you know, technology to um, uh, map the behavioral data, uh, you know, uh, analyze, what are some of the top questions and top uh, issues? Is it transportation? Is it uh, you know maneuvering through cities? The other problems more with architectural spaces, your household products. I mean, I mean, I didn't know until I researched that you know umbrella is a pretty useless, uh, useless object for people with disability, uh, and and I didn't know that when you have to walk, you have to use two hands for balance. So whether it's holding a baby, whether it is uh, holding an umbrella in a rain when you are carrying a lot of uh, saman in, in a road like India, or utensils which require a handle and you have to carry, or furniture shutters where you have to open and apply a lot of pressure at every stage, whether it is fashion, footwear, transportation, interiors, architecture, nothing, uh, no, none of the solutions those exist. Uh, made sense, right, at that point, and I was tempted to challenge and come up with a simpler solution, probably is more accommodating, more embracing, you know, more functional, but at the same time more delightful, uh, because why, uh, in contrast, why the products which are designed for special needs have to look tacky, mechanical, ugly, heavy, you know, because one of the ladies I spoke to, she said that I passed through the shoe market and you know, I feel like I also want these uh, fancier shoes and, uh, you know, why there aren't um, shoes with high heels and glossy materials and um, uh, really uh, high fashion shoes for... So I think it's it's both ways. I think how can we be at the, at the sweet spot of these uh, and how can we homogenize and bring harmony uh, at every level, whether it's system, services or products, uh, digital or physical products, I think it's a... It's a, it's a, it's a point. It's a tipping point from where we can actually uh, reimagine uh, better human lives and cultures uh, if if done well. Definitely, Darshan. Alok, would you like to add your point of view here? So, as uh, many dimensions have been shared by Darshan and and Anil and uh, and Darshan, thanks for sharing all these examples of uh, everyday life. What I would like to sum up with is uh, 
let's make sure that anything we are designing takes into account dignity of anyone using our stuff. And for me, that would be a kind of meta statement about inclusive design because we don't need to spend time trying to define. Otherwise, we'll be lost in definition land. We need to prototype, we need to try, we need to test, and uh, we need to show some stuff. And this has been shared by uh, Darshan and Anil. It's, the proof is in the pudding. So let's try to make pudding. That's my position. Great. It's been uh, awesome discussing this with you three. And I, I think I would like to give these 15 minutes now to everyone to uh, ask questions. I would like to share something. Um, until now, right, I had this um, mental block about uh, wheelchairs. So the kind of wheelchair that I've seen here in India, right, or nobody wants to try it. It just feels like you don't want to be there. I uh, recently saw a video on YouTube where a wheelchair is turned into something really cool where you can use the remotes to stand up, sit down, and move in different angles. Now, I really want to try that when I go to US. I think this is where, this is what I call innovation. All these kind of products, right, if we designers come together and innovate and bring in something newness to it, right, um, I think it'll be wonderful. Yeah, you know, in, in, in inclusive definition, that should be like a like an automobile that can be used perfectly by a normal human, uh, able perfectly able human for any trans transitions. At the same time, doubles up as a wheelchair. So the 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 name wheelchair itself needs to be redefined, right? In that sense, that why is it a wheelchair? It's a it's a mobile for all, right? It's a mobile for all, um, uh, and I think uh, that's that's the uh, place we need to hit and by the way I tried look I don't know about you but I tried looking for you know like for eco-friendly sustainability we have symbol do we have like a good positive you know, like a big hug or a heart emoji for inclusive design I really don't know if not we should totally design it tomorrow <laughs> even walking sticks for that example right yeah I'd say they're so bad like why do you have to have why do you have inclusive design symbols to be so skewed towards uh, disability? Like it has to be almost like like a human symbol of heart is what I was thinking of, or you know, like a nice little hug emoji that we use. Um, so it's sad that nothing much has been thought about that. One thing that I've observed is almost close to the forty percent of our walking sticks in India, which is used by elderly people, has a tennis ball on the other side. <laughs> For the group. Which, which is a Jugad solution <laughs> rather than a design solution. Why, why didn't why did the, the creators of walking stick, a manufacturers of walking stick, consider all this stuff? Yeah. At some point, the rubber is going to wear off. And now people have figured a Jugad to it. So, that is ball to but, it. But that was, that was one of the observations that a lot of... Uh, uh, these people who are underserved because of the product, they already have solution ready. So at least you have set of ideas already ready to start from it. It's just finishing that line, right? I mean, because they figured out how to f how to come over this on their own. And I found a lot of these solutions, their house, cars, everywhere. You know, they would do some regard. It's just that it's not manufactured. It's just uh, handmade. <laughs> Wait. So I guess people have started asking questions in the chat. I'll go one by one and ask you those questions. So first question is, uh, how can mass retail stores like Big Bazaar, DMART uh, design more inclusively and provide an experience rather than the same monotonous and expect boring experience? So is this question about the design of the mall or it's the design of, uh, uh, the, I, mean, I mean, any of these supermarkets are not inclusive from any point of view. You know, they're all congested, jam-packed, you know, even for a normal layman, it is just not easy, whether it is signage, directions, height, where it eye level, it, not even basic standards are followed. Uh, so one is just the planogram itself needs to be relooked at and how do you provide space um, 
second is uh, the material that you use right uh, the environmental material that you use the quality of light the floor makes it even more tougher the trolley itself you know with the trolley to take this sharp turn so there are i think somebody someone has to do the whole cultural mapping and do a re- thorough research or uh, and see different types of people coming into the store and making a record and a diary of what's going wrong first and i think that's the first step before even you go to the solution because we don't know i don't think we know uh, uh what are the problems are i mean the problems are more than what we imagined right now so i would do more inciting e-commerce is the answer <laughs> but then again uh, yeah there are other issues there Uh, so what is the future of uh, blending e-commerce with uh, all these uh, retail store and creating the interesting next experience would be my question and and india has all the ingredients to uh, not copy paste the 1950s retail store of the us in india which what happened with all these first generation of stores and rethink that is a fascinating design question definitely i look that's something that uh, we definitely can move towards uh, designing and have a blend of both maybe right. anjali uh, someone uh, anil you talked about legacy or darshan I spoke about legacy software yeah what about legacy hardware and that is where when uh, you talked about innovation i often put next to innovation the word inertia we talk a lot about innovation as opportunity because we are uh, positive if we were skeptical and negative we would say how to minimize the inertia in order to push the innovation is some thing i used to provoke my students and say okay we talk a lot about innovation and innovation management how are we going to kill out inertia and inertia is in so many places and it is when we talk about inclusive here embedded we had the discussion about how to minimize all these systems which have been designed uh, 150 years ago 100 years ago and still are ruling the way we are behaving so how do we disrupt that and it's a complex question but it's a fascinating one Sure, Alok. So I guess uh, Priyal uh, would be completely uh, puzzled by uh, our answers going into <laughs> some different directions. Yeah, I guess... Uh, uh, to sum up, we have a real estate uh, challenge in India. And uh, due to that, right, there are certain things they don't consider. Um, there is um, a walking ramp and a ramp for a wheelchair and there is a lift. That's it. They won't go beyond that. and some safety measures for the kids and again those things are not maintained regularly now let's get the basics right and then look at other experiences but good thing is um, i don't go to the physical store anymore for shopping i do most of it online until unless i want to have take the kids out and have a good time then i do that but e-commerce is an answer um, we can give really kick ass experience there whatever we want, we, we want to do for stores like bazaar big bazaar or dmart see again sure. here, the question is that certain economical sector would you know i know a lot of people i know that would prefer to go to dmart because of the discounts and they have this monthly habit of going and stocking up things right so how quickly this transformation will happen i don't know in current scenario what best one can do is to be more sensitive about some of these right uh, and similarly on e-commerce how do you make the whole experience uh, inclusive and easy and call to action so both needs to be improved in stand alone spaces but i i um, i like what alok is saying is that it's that's a radical thought <laughs> it's so new business model all together so sure, i think uh, considering the uh, time that we have i'd like to move to the next question 
Um, and the next question that we have is uh, being a UX uh, lead manager, how one should evangelize a coworker or client about the importance of inclusive design and adapting accessibility design principles, even if the budget is limited or timeline is short. So that uh, somewhere we covered it, but this has been a challenge for all the designers that we are running on the shorter timeline and the shorter budget. So how do we, um, you know, convince that? Uh, the importance of inclusive design. Maybe a session like this one is already a first step. Definitely. The, the second <laughs> one is pu pushing everyone to, uh, to show in each prototype, in each mockup, in each wireframe, in each deliverable that we are producing, are we taking that into account and make that from a principal approach to a cultural approach. We know that the speed of having things embedded in culture is different than some top-down principle. And so I, we don't have the answer, but we know as designers that we work on mindset. And we need then as design leaders, as studio owners, make sure that this mindset is embedded. And even if the client, and then I'm provoking Anil, even if the client is not willing to put money for that, we as designer, we say, dear client, we are offering that to you because we know what the user wants and we want to respect and make sure that user gets something that you as a client, you're not ready to pay. But we as a designer, we are offering that to you as a client and to the user. That is something which I find that we as designers, we have the power to do. Now, it will make us more white nights, less hours of sleeping and blah, blah. But we'll be so proud. I think so. That is my way of looking at stuff. Maybe a little bit naive, but OK, otherwise we won't be designer. Definitely, Alok. <laughs> OK, so uh, shall I take the next question? We have uh, a few minutes, three to four minutes to take up one next question. And probably what we could do is have a, a common platform where you know we'll make it accessible to you, where if you can write your answers, that will be great for the participants. Um, so the next question is, uh, as designers, we are experts at empathizing with people. But when we look at corporates or mass uh, manufacturers, they often are unable to empathize um, and thus don't see the need of accessibility and find it at has high cost and excuse. What would be the way to make them realize the need of accessibility in everyday products? I think you answered the first one as you know, having such sessions. Will that be applicable here as well? Yes, definitely. And also, I uh, we should line up your examples. So, in 2011, when I was trying to sell uh, design as a solution, no one was ready to listen to me. But when I showed examples of Apple. Airbnb, right? They were like, okay, okay, this is what design, the impact of design is. I think we should go with enough examples. A good example is I was talking about workstation, right? Where you can dismantle, adjust the height and all that. Um, and the number of sales that they've done is like, uh, it's, you can't believe the amount of sales they've done, especially during the COVID time. I think we should have enough examples first. Second one is the impact. The third one is the numbers. If we, if we can present that to the potential client, they will definitely pay attention to it. Uh, the one more additional thing I would do is uh, a lot of times we have done this uh, in our practice is that sometimes the market the market marketeers are not convinced, uh, but we still test out our concepts. We make sure that it goes as an additional concept to be tested for the consumers to um, see, because we know that here we have added more empathy. Here we have added, taken care of things that they are not necessarily interested in, but we still do that. And I think most of the times the results have shown that uh, if you are on the right track and you have identified the right 
uh, insight and solutions, you will get disproportionately high. Uh, so use the same templates and uh, matrices they are using to your advantage. And actually, if, in case you don't pass it, then there's something for you to learn. So be open about it. Which is a, an, an attitude of research and expanding the possibles, which is something which, uh, again, is putting the designer at the forefront of proposal rather than only listening to the market. Remember, if uh, Steve Jobs was waiting for the market uh, insights, then uh, Nokia would still be the king, huh? and Steve Jobs won't be, uh, uh, Apple wouldn't be the meta meta company. So I use that simple example. I, we designer, we are proposing stuff. We are not only listening to market, we are listening to people. And that is a, a zone we must show, we must make sure that we are not confusing listening to market versus listening to people. Um, it's easy to tell that in three sentences. It's difficult to do that. I think that's a, a great one said, Alok, that we have this power and we are the doers. Unless we do and we show what uh, we are capable of, people will not see that. So we should start from um, us and shouldn't be influenced or stopped by what market is doing or where you know uh, the country is going. So we should be enablers. And, and another word, let's uh, welcome what Priyal has added. Let's not forget touch, smell, and feel. Because yeah. these are components that we still have so much work to do on and which are neglected over visual only and so. Great, I think uh, more or less we have covered most of the questions and it has been a great thought provoking conversation. There are so many topics that have emerged out of this uh, today's conversation and we got to extend it further, have another session which will, where we will deep dive into this. But uh, uh, first and foremost, thank you for, uh, thank you three of you to you know, take out time to come here on this platform and share your thoughts and share your experiences. It's been great. And I'm sure that with the participants that are there, I'm, I'm sure it, it was a really great insightful session. Thank, thank you very so much, much Anjali. Thanks for organizing thank you, that. Thank you, Darshan. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, everyone. Darshan. Thank you, Alok. Thank you, thank you Anil. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.